I am going today to present a little bit of our work, um, what we've been doing here in Puerto Rico on restoring uh, mainly two species of sea urchins, but I'll be talking about the West Indian sea egg and about how um, other Caribbean nations can use restorative aquaculture um, to increase livelihoods, but also um, improve coral reef habitat. So as many of you might know, um, have jumped in the water uh, with your mask, um, you might have seen uh, dramatic changes through the decades. Um, once these coral reefs were full of life, um, a lot of coral are now being dominated by fleshy macroalgae and other species of algae um, that have degraded coral reefs. So today I'm gonna be talking about uh, a method called restorative aquaculture. Um, and this is what we've been doing to try to improve the coral reef uh, status or our state here in Puerto Rico. So restorative aquaculture, um, the definition of this is when uh, commercial or subsistence aquaculture provides direct ecological benefits um, to the environment or a habitat um, with the potential to generate net positive environmental outcomes. So since about 2015, uh, we've been active in uh, restocking the long spine sea urchin, also known as Diadema antelarum. Um, as many of you know, there was a mass mortality of these sea urchins in the early 1980s. And actually recently we've seen um, more recent mortalities um, throughout the islands. Um, but what we've been doing is collecting their post-larval settlers. So they go through a planktonic phase. And what we do is pretty much collect their babies in the water column. Um, and we bring them at, back into lab and we grow them to larger sizes. Um, and when there are larger sizes, then we transfer them to the reefs that really need help. Um, and as you can see in the bottom pictures on your screen, um, the, the picture that states before, this is before we, we restocked any sea urchin. And you can see that in this little quadrat, you can see that there's a lot of uh, fleshy macroalgae, dictyota, and it, it's covered in um, kind of like a sediment thick turf. As soon as we um, release the sea urchins, you can see dramatic changes um, in the algal composition. Uh, you can see that uh, they immediately, pretty much after a week, um, ate the fleshy macroalgae. And here in Puerto Rico, what we've been seeing is this encrusting algae called Ramicrusta. It's pretty aggressive and it can overgrow and kill corals. Um, and many like herbivorous fish um, don't like this algae, um, also herbivorous crabs. But what likes this algae is actually diadema and other species of sea urchin. So usually this uh, Rami crusta grows under this fleshy macroalgae. And you can see in the picture of one month, uh, the reef substrate is really clean. And that red stuff is the Rami crusta. And after two months, you can see that um, all the Rami crusta and fleshy macroalgae um, are removed from the this substrate. So we've been doing this and we've been able to restock over 6,000 diadema um, around uh, Puerto Rico. Um, but as you, you know, might know that there have been mass mortalities recently uh, with diadema, so we can't put all our eggs in one basket. So we've been trying to figure out um, some alternative um, uh, herbivores that we can actually restock. And uh, the ones that we are also focusing on now um, is the Tripnusti ventricosis. That's the West Indian sea egg, which is a, a commercially important species. This is highly demanded for its row. Um, it's a, a delicacy in, in many sushi restaurants. Um, and also we are um, producing Econometra veritas, which is the rock sea urchin. So with Tripnustes, we developed a small uh, larval hatchery um, and all our, um, all our research is being conducted at the University of Puerto Rico um, at Mayaguez campus at the Marine Science Department. Um, and be, we, we produce Tripnustes, a West Indian sea egg, a little differently than diadema. Um, with diadema, the, the black sea urchin we collect, like I said, we collect their babies in the water column. 
with uh, the West Indian sea egg, we actually get them to spawn. So they release their eggs and um, their sperm and we fertilize their eggs and we grow the larvae in the lab. And they have, this is their larvae um, and uh, they're very small microscopic. Uh, and it takes about uh, 24 to 26 days for these larvae to be competent and starts growing their body parts to be able to tr transition into a small sea urchin. So one of these body parts are the pedicillaria, which are, the urchins have two feet, and these are just modified two feet that have claws. And you can see in the picture to the right, um, this larvae um, is a competent larvae and is starting to produce a small two feet off of their body. So when they're competent, we then transfer them into small tanks and we get them to settle out. Um, and uh, at first, like the first 30 days, it's really hard to identify them. Um, but at day 50, at day 45, you can see um, they're almost a millimeter in size. Or sorry, two millimeters in size. And what we've been doing uh, with these trypnuses is that we've been outplanting them um, in, uh, in seagrass beds with invasive seagrass, Holophila stipulaceae. Um, they have been eating the invasive seagrass, um, but also we did a really small experiment to see um, how they would do uh, on the reef. And what we did, and the reason why we enclosed them is that sea urchins love to escape. Even if you put up these walls, they'll find ways to escape. So this is just one way to um, be able to, um, I guess, document uh, the changes that they're uh, making on the reef. So this small experiment we did uh, off of one of the reefs in, in La Parguera, which is in the southwest part of Puerto Rico. And we placed uh, five uh, trypnustes in a, a one meter uh, corral, um, as you can see in the picture. And we did the same thing like we do with the black uh, spine sea urchin. We go and we do uh, we monitor and see what are the changes on the reef substrate. Um, this is a top view of one of the corrals, and um, it's kind of mucky because this site has a lot of turbidity. The water's kind of dirty, and also the reef substrate is just fully covered in fleshy macroalgae, as you could kind of see in this picture. So after uh, after one month, uh, you can see that, sorry, yeah, after one month, um, you can see that the reef looks much cleaner. Um, the trypnustes has, uh, they have eaten all the dictyota and fleshy macroalgae. Um, they do take longer to eat the algae on the reef um, at, compared to diadema, but we believe they're as effective um, in the long run and removing fleshy macroalgae and also the encrusting algae, um, ramicrusta. So in, in conclusions, um, as you can see, uh, well, the restorative aquaculture um, can provide food and alternative livelihood, like the West Indian sea egg can be raised to um, for a fisheries resource. Um, but as you can see, it can also be used to improve habitats. And these are two pictures to the right. Um, this is a reef without e sea urchins, and we did some coral outplanting. And you can see that cyanobacteria and fleshy macroalgae are overgrowing the corals. Um, but the same species of corals and same genotypes of these corals were placed on a reef with diadema. And you can actually see the the difference um, what it makes to have sea urchins on a reef compared to um, uh, compared to reefs without urchins. So uh, restorative aquaculture can also improve um, habitats, especially when we're talking about fish habitats, reef fish habitats, um, and it could help us uh, mitigate and adapt to climate change, especially um, seaweed aquaculture, which I believe um, there will be another presentation. So. I'd like to thank you. Here's my contact information. You can visit our organization. We are a small nonprofit organization, um, the Institute for Socioecological Research. 
um, and you can contact me with any details. So thank you. Thank you very much, Stacy, for your presentation. It was very informative and encouraging and to understand that this aquaculture activity can benefit us in many ways in terms of food, climate change and reef restoration. So this work is very encouraging. Who, I guess those who know about aquaculture or sea urchins knew that it's very difficult or it's limited success in growing sea, sea urchins in an in, in aquaculture setting. Now I see a few hands raised and we actually have time for a few questions. The first was by Peter Murray, followed immediately by Chris Parker. So please go ahead, Peter, then Chris. Thank you. Uh, I asked purely out of ignorance, are there any predators for T. ventricosis and what are the implications um, or the impacts of, of predation likely to arise uh, in terms of their survivorship if they were actually not in corals? If you put them out there in the wild, um, you know, from what you you know, what are the chances of survival given that they are lab red? Yeah, that's a great question. So their major predators are triggerfish, the queen triggerfish. Um, and that goes for the long spine sea urchin and also trypneustes, the uh, West Indian sea egg. Um, so we try to avoid reefs right now that have high populations of triggerfish um, because uh, they will eat a lot of your sea urchins when you release them. Um, and the retention, like the, so when we release the sea urchins at, at different reef, um, what we, what we call retention is the number of sea urchins that kind of last in that area. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they were eaten. They might have just, um, uh, moved to another area because we've, we have documented diadema, um, escaping the corrals and moving as far as 30 meters from the area. So when we talk about retention rates of these urchins after we release them, it's all de really dependent on many factors. And that is like the predators, as I mentioned, the trigger fish. It could also um, be uh, the habitat. If there's not enough food for these urchins, um, they will up and go and, and go to a different spot. Um, damselfish, uh, damselfish, if you have three spot damselfish, they're pretty aggressive and they won't eat the sea urchins, but they'll be, uh, annoying to the sea urchins enough to where the sea urchins will just get up and move away. Um, and, uh, I think those are the, the, really the major factors, um, for what would, what would retain these urchins. And what we've been seeing here in Puerto Rico, the the, re the retainment of urchins after we release, it varies from about 40% of the urchins to uh, as close as 80% of the urchins uh, will stay in one habitat. So, um, and some uh, actually have uh, mostly escaped the reef and we think it's probably the damselfish um, populations. So I hope I answered your question. Well enough, thank you. Yes, go ahead, Chris, and then we'll take one question from the chat um, shortly thereafter. Well, good afternoon, Stacey. This is um, very exciting news, I, I, I must say. I mean, I, I think you have many Barbadians tapping their feet happily <laughs> at the concept that um, there has been successful laboratory rearing of C, C, um Sea eggs. Uh, well, what we call sea eggs is the West Indian sea, um, sea urchin, the, the white sea urchin, tripping stays. Um, just to add, um, one of the um, predators um, is actually the queen conch as well. They could um, they, they smother the, they cover the um, sea urchins and you can see the little holes sometimes in the test. Um, wow, unfortunately, in the case, yeah, well, unfortunately, in the case of Barbados, um, your main predators, if you put them out there, will be the people. <laughs> I'm sure. uh, yeah, that's what I hear. <laughs> but um, just a quick question in that regard. Um, what was sort of the production levels out of the, um, from, the lab, from the laboratory we were in? What was the success rate? Like how many juveniles were actually, um, you know, what's the scale of production basically? Yeah. Yeah, we started with a really small scale because of just limited funding. We actually just received um, some more funding. So we are increasing our production. So in small scale, uh, we had 
from larvae to settlement, um, we had about 6% um, mm. survivorship, which I hear is pretty high in aquaculture. That's actually um, very good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, so good, yeah. we had, yeah, and we've been following and our, our, our mentor has, I don't know if you know, uh, David Cohen, he uh, has a hatchery of, uh, Tripnustis gratilla uh, in Hawaii, and he has been able to produce mm -hmm. like I think a million urchins. Yeah. Um, so he has been helping us um, kind of uh, figure out the protocols, and I'm actually working on a manual right now that I can I'll be able to share with whoever is interested. Um, but yeah, I, I think I hope when we get to larger scales, we'll be able to produce thousands. For our first um, larval run, we were able to produce 200 urchins um, and it was steadily increasing. I think we produced like 400. We've only did, we only did like, I think two runs or three runs right now. Yes, th thank you for that answer. Uh, I, I promise to take one question from the chat, then we'll indulge one further oral question from Mr. Kong and then you'll have to move on. So the question from the chat, I will read it. And it simply speaks about what are the next steps for your research? Yeah, so we um, we, we were lucky enough to uh, be awarded a pretty large, um, uh, pretty, pretty large funds from NOAA, which is the National Atmospheric and Oceanographic Administration. It's a federal agency in the United States. Um, and we are going to be increasing our capacity in all regards. So um, that includes producing corals, uh, producing three species of sea urchins, as I mentioned, diadema, antelarum, the long spine sea urchin, Echinometra viridis, Echinometra viridis, yet they're small, they're very mighty. Um, if you, they can, uh, they are as effective as diadema, you just need more of them. Um, and also Tripnustes, and we'll be producing also herbivorous crabs. So we're going to be doing a large-scale ecosystem-based restoration um, in the next four years here in Puerto Rico, along with a lot of partners. Yes, thank you. Mr. Kong, can you proceed, please? Then we'll have thank to you. move on thank after you. that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. In your work, did you look at the cause and rate of eutrophication? In, in, in these areas, I would imagine that increased rate of eutrophic eutrophication would have an impact on the results. Did you look at anything, for for, like for example, density of urchin, of sea urchin um, per unit area that, 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 that would make um, an impact? I think that, that, yes. that is an interesting question. Yeah, so there is actually, and I could uh, share if you contact me, there's actually uh, one of the masters, um, I was on the committee of a master student who actually uh, looked at uh, what are the ideal densities of diadema, this is a long spine sea urchin, um, needed to reduce and maintain um, algal cover low on coral reefs. Because you don't want too many of these urchins because they do buy erode the reef structure. Um, but you want enough that they can maintain algal cover pretty low. So um, there are studies um, that have uh, uh, measured this. And yeah, I can share that information with you if you contact me. Um, and yeah, so I think I, I answered your question. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Stacy Williams. Very informative. And I'll ask Ms. Makiba Felix to go ahead and load her presentation. And while that's loading, we'll indulge a very brief question and response from a, a question from Alvin Pontian and response from Stacy Williams, since we haven't heard from Mr. Pontian for the day. Okay, thanks. Um, just a quick question. As you relates to the stony coral disease that is happening within the region and also the dying off of the diademas throughout the region for the past um, um, six months or stuff, have you taken um, um those um impacts uh, into consideration with your your study thanks yes uh so with uh diadema um in puerto rico uh we have well we're not lucky because we're actually um we're now seeing another mortality of diadema on the northwest coast of puerto rico um but the mortality events with the uh, long spine sea urchin um 
and a year ago were concentrated in Culebra on the north coast of Puerto Rico. So our nurseries are located in the east um, of Puerto Rico and the southwest of Puerto Rico. And what we've been doing is that uh, we, at our land-based nursery, we have upped our filtration system. So um, we've installed uh, more UV lights, um, stronger UV lights, and we have uh, also adapted our protocols for bringing any algae in um, that we need to feed these urchins or anything outside with the corals. Um, and now the corals, not only uh, the disease is happening, but there's some bleaching uh, occurring now. And what we've been doing at our nurseries is that we've been bringing corals um, that have been hit really hard with stony coral tissue loss disease, like dendrogyras, like those are the pillar corals. Uh, we have been bringing those in and um, uh, keeping them in our tanks um, and make sure, making sure that uh, they uh, will stay alive while the water gets cooler. Again, uh, with the same thing with stony coral tissue loss disease, uh, we have amped up our filtration systems and our land-based nursery. And uh, we do not outplant any corals or diademo where there is an active mortality event occurring. So um, here in Puerto Rico, like the stony, stony, stony coral tissue loss disease um, has pretty, uh, has gone through the East Coast and most of the island and it's now making its way uh, along the West Coast, Southwest Coast. Um, so the, we've been out planting corals on the East coast and so far so good. Um, these corals haven't been affected or showing any disease signs. So, um, we have been taking precautions, um, both at our land-based nurseries and out planting or releasing corals and urchins.